So you guys are in for a real treat starting at 1130. Uh, the uh, Simon Vine production is a uh, really talented group of people talking about 5G. I thought it would be helpful to lead into uh, 5G with kind of a sense of where we are, but just to go back a year today was when we hit the market lows. So here are the numbers on how far we've come. And surprisingly, when I saw the list of best performers, it wasn't Tesla that was number one in the S&P, it was actually number two. Uh, Viacom was number one. But what I think people <clears throat> continue to underappreciate, there have been twice in the last 13 years where the Fed stepped in to save the money market industry. And the first was back in March of 09, uh, when Bernanke stepped up with QE, uh, with QE and it unfroze the credit markets. And then I think last year on March 23rd, uh, Powell stepped in and uh, really changed the dynamic. And I'd, I shudder to think what would have happened if the money markets in either time period uh, were allowed to uh, go the way they were going because the credit markets were completely out of whack. So whether you agree with all the policies of the Fed uh, or not, it is safe to say in my view that what they did on those two dates in terms of saving the U.S. economy was considerable. So uh, I just uh, share that. But, you know, as we think about what's happened in the last year at ARS, we focus on these six critical transformations <laughs> and they're all interrelated. And, uh, you know, we touched on in the, in the lead-in mark, the educational one, you're gonna get into climate tomorrow and uh, some of the social stuff with the ESG group. Um, but I think today we want to focus on the digital transformation and the bank, I'm sorry, the Bureau of uh, Economic Analysis came out with a report last year um, that goes through two, 2018 and it was how big is the digital economy. And before I get into the numbers that you can see here, <clears throat> what I'd point out is they're still trying to figure out how to calculate it. Uh, they are still scrambling to get numbers on things, but if this was the numbers in 2018, imagine where we are going into 2021 and beyond. Um, so 9% of GDP um, and uh, really above average growth rate to the market, almost threefold uh, and 8.8 .8 million jobs. And if you think about the jobs that were lost in the manufacturing sector, I think we carved out in the decline of the manufacturing sector about 13 million jobs. So the digital economy is whittling that back and, and making an improvement there. And then you can see the share of the digital economy by year from 05, and it is a steady climb up. Uh, and it's really, we think is about to really take off and you'll hear that from the 5G guys. And then when you think about the digital economy as a share of the industry of total GDP, uh, number one, and I'm sorry for the left side is a little light, but that's real estate rental and leasing at the top, followed by the government, followed by manufacturing. And in 2018, the digital economy was fourth in, the, in there. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I think you're really ahead of finance and insurance. So you're really seeing the uh, transformation of the economy going right in front of us. And when you think about it as a share of total employment, a similar story, but really starting to accelerate. Um, and we expect more to move into this area. And I think the last couple of years will even enhance that even further. And then you look at the real value added elements of uh, average annual growth of the different components of it. And at the top, you see the total economy growing at 1.7%, the digital economy at 6.8%. Business to consumer e-commerce was 12% growth rate during that period. And we all know what happened last year. Cloud services continue to really ramp up as well. And even hardware, because the more uh, sophisticated the technology gets, the more antiquated our technology gets that much faster. So uh, these are all important uh, percentage shifts, but it gives you an idea in a slow growing economy, how important this area is uh, continued to be. And this is another look at the real gross output index. So it's how much contribution is the digital economy making relative to the total economy. And you can see the contribution to the growth is higher and also the contribution of prices is lower. So you're seeing the digital economy coming down here in terms of its price impact. So it's lowering costs and uh, adding to growth, which is really the dynamic we're looking for. But as you saw from the, <clears throat> excuse me, the meetings in Alaska last week, um, 
the U.S. and China are not on a good, are not in a good place, and they're actually getting to a worse place. Unfortunately, the rest of the world views the U.S. as vulnerable and is taking liberties. Um, the way the uh, meeting was supposed to start, each country was supposed to have two minutes of uh, opening remarks. The U.S. did there too. The Chinese, with translation, did 20 minutes, and it was a scathing uh, attack on the U.S. So safe to say that the relationships aren't getting better, but there is a battle that uh, you're gonna hear from the 5G guys that's going on for tech leadership. And it gets to uh, so much about how our economies, how military and economics are gonna work and society interacts that it's really a, a critical element of how we move forward. So what's the importance of the digitaliz digitalization transformation? And in our view, it's about the productivity improvements that are gonna flow through the entire economy. It starts with inflation expectations and the, our view at ARS is productivity is the antidote for inflation. This is a critical uh, element of how we're seeing the world going forward. And while there's a lot of talk about the inflation pressures that we're experiencing in the near term, uh, longer term, we think productivity solves that. And uh, we're seeing that. I showed you the gross uh, input pricing coming down. So input costs come down with that. It increases our efficiencies overall, and it will help offset some of the demographic challenges companies are facing. The digital transformation is not just cloud and all that, but it's also about incorporating exoskeletons to help workers work longer in uh, repetitive mo motion uh, tasks. It's other elements that are coming in ways we haven't thought about it. <clears throat> it also supports uh, reshoring in the manufacturing renaissance. And we're also, as I mentioned, we're fighting a war for technological supremacy with China. So we're gonna have to really be focused on how we manage this going forward. So um, you're gonna hear how, uh, where we are in the cycle and what's coming. I think of 5G as an enabling technology. It's not the breakthrough technology. I think more likely the breakthrough technology is going to be artificial intelligence and how that uh, simplifies and accelerates uh, the processes for doing uh, so much of how we operate businesses, governments, and uh, how we defend our economies as well. So I think this is going to be um, a really fascinating period. And what you hear from the guys following uh, is going to really shed some light on where we are and what's coming. Uh, but there's a lot more that's ahead of us. And I think the best is yet to come. So I'll stop there, Mark, and uh, we can open up for discussion. Well, I, I always, when you stop, I always like, I'm waiting for like, I wish it would go another five minutes, but. I'm uh, out of slides. No, it's all good. Hey, Steve, Steve, I guess my, my question is, and, and I, I totally agree with everything you said about the freight train that the digital economy is and should be. Um, but when you look at that, um, I don't know if you've, if, if you've looked at the um, consequences of that uh, in, in, uh, in terms of, of transitioning to the digital economy from the people who are not digital at all, and that those people really become uh, 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 on the on, on the doll, so to speak. They become wards of the state from a um, a care perspective. You know, unemployment, uh, healthcare costs, and, and, and we've seen this right in the last with technology. Is that the, this places workers Typically, it's the younger workers who benefit from it, and the older workers who don't. And so, I, I, you know, as the digital economy continues to just replace and displace, um, what does that impact on, on yeah, government cost? It's a great question, Jim. Because we're in we're in the period in a period of some of the greatest creative discussion destruction the world has ever seen, and that means we have to redo the systems that support the economy and support our nation. Um, and then the question, and I think what you're getting at is, is the government and our, is, is the private sector up for it? And the answer is uh, CBD. Um, I think uh, if you listen carefully to what Powell and Janet Yellen are saying, they're very focused on the economic scarring that's coming from the shifts in the economy both the financial crisis and these layoffs. Um, 
and they're trying to carry the economy long enough, but that doesn't deal with the issue you're addressing, which is how do we how do we help the people that are displaced or uh, left this by the side? And um, I think that's a real issue that uh, with all the money we're spending, if we don't solve it, solve that as part of it, we're going to have a we're going to have a problem later on. Um, or immediately and then more so later on. That's the economic scarring that we've talked about a lot. Um, I don't know that they're focused on it the way they should be in the fiscal side. And it gets to part of what we're talking about uh, the educational challenge that exists today. Um, but reskilling has got to be a key priority and it's not being talked about enough by in the plans we've seen so far. Although with the numbers that are coming out that are being suggested by the uh, President Biden's aides for their next uh, little initiatives. Um, you're talking about several trillion dollars of additional spending. And I would just say, Jim, I share your view. I think that uh, what I think is your view that if we don't, if we're not addressing it there, I don't know when we're ever going to because uh, the spending will start to dwarf what the growth is gonna be. So I think it's a big issue that government's gonna have to face up to. I don't know if they're ready for it. Yep. Okay, thanks. I wish I could give you something a little more optimistic. That's a Hey, Jim, we haven't seen you actually in person for like six weeks. You see that picture every week, but just, just does that to be this week? It's just once, once in a while. Ah, there he is. We're starting to get worried about you, Jim. Wait, is the that picture, enough? Picture, moving. The picture is moving. much better looking. So, you know, you're able to Photoshop certain pictures, but, you know, the, the live video... But anyway, so Stephen, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting, and to the extent that people are aware and address it, it's important. But I, I, I like you, I think it gets, um, it gets lost in the wake because the, uh, you know, the, the, the digital economy is, 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 is a locomotive. And, uh, and I think that unless, and, and it will fall to the government because I think, you know, private companies, um, aren't going to uh, believe they have the social responsibility to, uh, you know, to, 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 to do that unless they absolutely have to. Um, and so I think it's, it's really going to fall to the government. And, um, you know, and, and I think <clears throat> if we go around to, to places that um, got really hurt badly uh, in the 80s, the old industrial places, uh, there are a lot of those uh, uh, suburbs of Cleveland and Pittsburgh that truly never recovered. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so, so it's, just, it's an overall kind of social concern. Uh, I, I also have. wonder, Jim, to that point, if the unions back then did what they should have done and if they're going to do it now yeah. um, for their displaced workers, are they doing the reskilling and, the, and providing the hmm. support as well as the government? Um, because that's something they got to get ahead of because they know it's coming. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not I'm far from knowledgeable in that space, but um, I think that's one of the areas as they seem to be starting to get better uh, negotiating power right now. Are they going to really take that lead on their end too? Let me ask, I see BJ's had his hand up. I was going to ask for some international perspectives anyways. So go ahead, BJ. Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation. I think uh, one of the biggest ironies about the US is that while we have an additional divide in, on the international circuit, you know, large parts of Asia, Africa still don't have internet. Some people don't even have access to mobile phones. And even those that do, countries that have very censorship anyway, but within the US context, there is a, digital, a huge digital divide. You know, there's a large swaths of population which don't have access to the internet. The COVID situation has just shown, has your previous conversation is that access to computing and hardware is, is another issue. You've got silos of very rich families and areas which have everything, iPads and everything. And then you've got schools with nothing. Um, and also there's another thing going on in the background is digital neutral, neutral actress, or whatever you're calling it right now. Uh, and the big companies are, are, are looking to divide and create a new internet exclusive Netflix and everything is showing that there is a divide. And in terms of the industrial factor, 
as you, as Stephen has rightly pointed out, the, you you're not ready. You haven't geared up. There's going to be a huge population of people who aren't geared up. Uh, and it's interesting that internationally, Microsoft, Cisco, and everyone are training people through digital academies. But I haven't seen that really in the U.S. You have pockets of developments of where you're retraining the youth on how to do programming and stuff, but there's still a big gap. And unfortunately, the American middle class dream is out the window. Um, and until you tackle that, you're going to be left really behind. China is ahead of the curve, way ahead of the curve. So anyway, I'll keep quiet. No, no, I don't, I don't mean, just want to get other voices in. I appreciate all that. I, I, and including your last point. Other other thoughts, questions? I, you know, I, I, would, I think I agree with everybody on the, the reskilling. Unfortunately, I, the private sector is not going to do it. I, I'm not convinced that the government can do it either, to your point, Stephen. So where does that leave? It leaves it up to the individual, right? And, you know, and if you look at history, you know, we haven't been really good at upskilling people as, you know, the industrialized nation kind of evolved. So, you know, I think people, individuals are going to have to, many of them train themselves. Yeah, and that's not easy, but they're going to have to find you know, the right resource. Like, you know where that comes to, Tom, is one of the other subjects we're focusing on is mentoring. And yeah. you, you, and we were, I was talking with people in New York. We're having this debate. I'm going to go to an event where the, you know, I don't want to be in with one candidate for the mayor, but I'm, we all want to, I mean, I hopefully people in the world want to see New York rebound. And one of the questions like, well, you have to make it compelling. But what is compelling is, is I think the new people in their 30s and 40s moved out of New York. People in their 20s are still mobile, but go in. But they, where are their mentors? Where is that training? Just, I'm just talking about finance, let alone industrial. That, and that's the reskilling requires, and this is probably what something you can cover, uh, Sarah, is you know, that whole tech, tech can only go so far, but you need a people factor. And that's, and that's exactly what I was, what I refer to when I go across the country talking to people and they all nod their heads and they say the right words. And I challenge everyone as I do in this forum to not just talk about it, but to put the action and the money behind the issues that concern you in education around especially equity, social justice, uh, and opportunity for those that, um, you know, don't have the opportunity. So it's everything that we're talking about. I would just add, though, that as negative as I am on the government getting stuff done, so you, I think people know that by now I'm not a big fan of their uh, uh, efficiency. Um, we have as a country multiple times in the past dealt with similar issues. And uh, if we had a big plan and drove towards big issues, following World War II, we did it different points of time in our history where we needed to step up as a nation. We did when we identified a big solution and those big solutions led to other big solutions, whether it was going to the moon or whatever you wanna to refer to it. A lot of the technologies we're living with today are remnants from things like the moon or moon programs or space programs and the like. So I'm not as negative that we can do it. I'm not sure that, uh, I know we can. It's a question of, do we have the people to do it? Uh, I think it's a different way of looking at it. I think the big, the the big difference between us and China is China can kind of take the long view, right? Yep. You know, you, and we can't, I mean, you, you got uh, politicians that have to get reelected every two to four years. And that prohibits us from like addressing the litany of big issues that this country has to kind of address, right? There was um, just an article about that. Wasn't that in the New York Times this morning about Biden? He has one year to do something and then the rest of the time to go for re-election. Yeah. Well, we were talking about that with, with impact, you know, even with like how you allocate on ESG basis, you know, it's going to be, there's volatility. Rob, but everyone's looking at quarter by quarter. You know, you're, you know, Stephen Burke, you're like, how are you doing with, on my account today? Um, and the long term, it requires a longer term 
view on some of these issues. Uh, the way at, I, the risk, at the risk of right. at the risk of being controversial here, can I, I like, ask a question? I like, I like controversy. It's good. Go. So so you look at something like the you know people we have a lot of people in the country regardless of the opportunity they've had some with great opportunities and some with not so great opportunities but they make bad decisions and at some level we've got to help people make better decisions and hold them accountable for making decisions and i'll give you a couple examples i mean we've all started to see the number of people that don't want to get the covid vaccine now i'm not telling anybody what they should do but the numbers seem pretty bizarre to me. How many people don't seem to want to get it? Um, that would be one thing. I'd cite something else. And Sarah, maybe you could uh, comment on this. Why is, and I might be a little off on this percentage, but I'm not far off. Why is it that women are 10% of the engineering students in higher education facility, uh, institutions? It's a really low number. And that's where a lot of the new technology jobs are coming from. And I'm not making a value statement, a judgment on either of those, but what I'm saying is, you know, some of these people are, are very well educated. They've got great opportunities and they simply, for whatever reason, are in choosing to ignore a career path. In a, you know, I don't, so I don't, and so, and that, and the COVID, COVID vaccine thing to me, you know, we got it. We need to create opportunities, but we also have to establish a framework where people are accountable to use the resources that are there and to embrace the opportunities that are there. And I don't know if we're doing enough on that front. And I don't know if you want to hear my response. <laughs> I'd love to hear it because I, I, I said it would be controversial, right? And, you know, so well, don't tell I, me I'm full of it. But I, well, no, you know what I think? I think it might be interesting for 361 to have a venue where women get to share um, what they've experienced in the worlds of business, academia, um, when opportunities present themselves, how in fact they aren't followed through. I would love to know, um, I mean, I intersect, I've worked in politics, I've worked in government, I've worked in policy, I, I'm in academia. It's a very, it's still a very gender biased world. And so um, I think when you talk about the 10%, it's not always choice. It's also who gets admitted. I can well, jump no, in. I think also, Mark, you showed starts, the slides about it starts Tracy. earlier. It starts earlier. Uh, that's definitely a factor, Sarah. And, yep. and this is something Tracy Edwards is going to talk about. And, and Zach, I hear his voice. So, is that yeah, I was going to comment on what she, she does. I wanted to do it yesterday also, and you sh mentioned her. Um, basically, Tracy was the first captain of a crew that did the world race for sailing in the 80s. Uh, so it was always been like men only before. And now, uh, so yeah, this is the map of the race. Uh, oh, I and love now, the yeah. Yes, yeah, so and now through their organization, they basically inspire girls to get into STEM and they tackle a lot of like, uh, you know, girl education, uh, social issues around the world. Um, I think, I thought it was so powerful because it also applies to what you were saying is that to, to show people a role model mm -hmm. and breaks the barrier, right? Now, a more related thing to science is like, okay, you have Elon Musk, for example, who's a scientist celebrity, but he's a male. So if you have someone that's like a lady in a similar fashion, also inspiring the next generation that, it's, okay, it's possible you could be this rock star scientist uh, inventing new technologies and uh, pushing the frontier. You know who's like the poster person for this is Peg Wyant. Jack's wife, who was uh, yeah, one of the first women executives at Procter and Gamble, and she wrote a book that is phenomenal. I think um, maybe we can work at getting a panel together to talk about that. And Zach, I would love that information. I sail, and so I would love um, the contact that you just mentioned. I didn't see her. Uh, she, she's speaking tomorrow, and hopefully we're yeah. going to do a fundraiser for the organization also, similar to the... Fabulous. Uh, 
support event we did before. So with 361 Foundation. And the last comment on your um, comment about a forum for uh, ladies on 361. Um, I was going to mention, yeah, I think we need we need help, you know, and in, in inviting more ladies, you know, uh, through your networks and whatnot. Because I think most of us here in finance, most of the people we know in finance are also men, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, another lady is most, more likely to have a bigger network of lady friends. Um, so we need help, I think. Better. Yeah, okay. I, I agree. I'll switch back. This is really, then we're going to talk about 5G, but tomorrow we will talk about uh, impact. And as you'll see, one of the areas that I'm, I'm asking us is for us to, and we need help. And we need help, you know, and I also want global uh, diversity, you know, ethnicity and, and, and gender. And it's, you know, we all have our networks. And I guarantee you, as I look at Bonnie and Helena and Denise and Anne, and uh, you're, you know more women than I do, uh, you know, professionally and otherwise. So we need, we need help. And I'd like us to have a fall summit on the same subject. And let's see, let's see where we are. Uh, and we'll have the fall for women also, right? In the uh, beginning of April, uh, beginning of May. Yeah, in fact, that's... Um, we're looking at future work. Denise wants to rebrand this, uh, focus on women. Maybe you said the future of women, Denise. Um, what was your thought there? Um, wording matters. And I think mm. that we are all kind of collectively recreating what the language is for the future of work. And I just dropped in the, in the chat there that the future is female. And my perspective on that, we can explain more at the panel. Skill set, latent potential, demographic change. Personally, I don't think is that there's been a bunch of dudes sitting around a table holding women back. I just think that in the longevity of the U.S. economy, we haven't had our time yet, but the time is now. So the future is female for all very analytical and real reasons, which we'll definitely discuss in our panel. But part of re-narrating, reimagining that is really coming to grips with a new language. So saying focus on women, that doesn't, yep. I wouldn't call that demeaning. It's just not very clear on what that is. I think we need to upgrade the language and get consensus on the new words that we want to use collectively. So for every situation or panel we have, it's about women. If we don't have an equal number of men, we're missing the boat because the well, future work is about being human, not about being a woman. Yeah, I, I wonder if there's an opportunity, uh, Mark, um, to also maybe reach out to universities and have a panel that includes, um, you know, universities with school, with schools of engineering. Uh, and, you know, I'm actually, I do a lot with Columbia University and, um, and I think there's a reasonably good representation of, of females to males uh, ratio there. But nonetheless, um, you know, for me, it's more a question of out, how, how do you do an outreach to students that are in high school, right, or in middle school, um, and, 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 and provide the, um, you know, the Elon Musk's type of, of, of role models, if you will, that you know gee there's you know there's a pathway here you know and 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 i think there's really a, I, more instead of you know me talking to me that's not that interesting but you know being able to t you know, reach out and bring in and, and 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 embrace the next you know generation of young women uh and give them and show them the opportunities uh you know my daughter for personally is you know, is, is a junior in high school and she's extremely good in math and, 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 and taking classes at, you know, took classes last summer at Columbia, maybe this summer at Harvard. And, um, you, you know, and, and that's where she, you know, that's her, her interest level. Right. And so I think, but I think, you know, she has me, to you know, listen to me all the time. There are a lot of women who don't have, you know, Jim, you know, telling her what her opportunities are. And I think that's really important. I know, in fact, I know of some really talented, talented, super smart women who were never encouraged that they could you know, be more than, you know, whatever. So I think, I'm not sure with that, how that fits with 361, but. It's perfectly. So it, if I have a 16 year old and a four year old and everybody gets to see my four year old a lot. My 16 year old you only, is, is strong in math and science. And everyone's looking for their role models, right? Yeah. Um, look, we're going to hit that tomorrow uh, and, and as part of the key topic. Um, 
So we're here to, you know, Simon has put together a great panel of, of something else that's transformative. And actually, as you can see the slide, um, you know, it was my dialogue with Simon to say like, where are the women? And, uh, you know, so Helena came up, Vani came up and I'm, you know, we had the same thing with Denison connecting, you know, where are the African-Americans? Where are the Hispanics? Where are the women? So we had that same issue, um, but we'll, we just all have to like help. We need help. Um, so I'm gonna turn over to you, Simon. This is a bigger topic. We're gonna hit it tomorrow uh, and we're gonna measure ourselves. I just wanted to, uh, uh, let's, let's learn. We've got a lot of people who are new to us. I just wanna also just share a little, uh, it was a little quirky, so just, you know, 361, we may not have the best, we know the 5G, or, I mean, talk about my 16 year old, everyone's using Wi-Fi in my house. So if this is quirky, uh, latency, I apologize. Yeah, it's gonna happen about five times, maybe six times. Oh, it keeps happening, I'll, uh, I will, I'll add lib here. So if, if you're new to 360, we go around the world. We've been to 55 cities, 20 countries. And that's also part of our, what we wanted to do is have geographic diversity. We don't just want investors, we want talent, both fund managers and thought leaders. And I'm the first to go to college in my family. Bear with. So I knew that would happen. Sorry about that. So with, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Simon. Uh, I know a lot of people want to share their, their screens. Uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, do that if you'd like, or I'll flip. And Simon has been, a, as I say, he's a poster child. In many, uh, many ways, he's, he's engaged, he, he invests, he's involved with philanthropies, and he's intellectually uh, curious, and, uh, and he's a doer. So thank you, Simon. 